you've made it to Cairo Hustle. Sit back and learn from the greatest influencers in the profession. This week's episode is brought to you by Clothes for Cairo, Imaging Services, Zingit Solutions, Universal Tractioning Systems, Peter Goldman's Zone School of Healing, Legacy Wealth Management, Posture Screen, Cairo Thin, Everest Coaching Systems, Cairo Moguls, Rhino Coaching, Cairo Matchmakers, Chiropractic Jobs Online, and Bax Max. Let's hustle. Hey guys, welcome to episode 96 of Cairo Hustle. I'm your co-host Luke Millette. Here's your host, Jim Chester. So today we have the opportunity of interviewing Dr. Sean McCaffrey. And if you guys want to get an old school perspective on chiropractic healing, stay tuned. So Dr. Sean, tell us about your chiropractic story and what really influenced you to become a chiropractor? You know, um, I had it in my family for a little over a century. Uh, my grandfather was friends with D.D. Palmer, and he was treated by D.D. Palmer when he was a child. Uh, he and his mother and, and father were all treated by uh, the original founder of the profession. So he really heavily influenced him and in what he believed chiropractic was meant to be and what it became later on. Uh, he then paired up with other doctors, Thurman Fleet, some of the old time guys, and really that's where it came from. So I've had it in my family from my birth. And I remember my grandfather, you know, treating us all the time uh, when we go up to northern Wisconsin and, and visit him and stuff. And then his sons, um, my uncles, they kind of encouraged me along the way. And my uncle James especially uh, really, really pushed me. And as I started kind of looking into this, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do in life. Uh, I was fortunate enough that I, I got into law school. I got into medical school. And I didn't like either of those options at the time. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to go to chiropractic. And I remember telling my uncle at the time, I said, you know, I don't want to do what they do today. I don't want to be, you know, a, a backcracker. I don't want to be, you know, neck pain, back pain, headache kind of person. I want to be a physician. And my uncle was like, and you need to do exactly what, you know, grandpa did. You need to, you need to focus that way. He goes, you just need the license. So I applied to schools and, and I got in and I, I thought, okay, what does this mean? And my uncle gave me a list. Uh, and I've since complied, you know, I've, I've redone the list for my son in the future if he wants to follow. Uh, but that list was a who's who of everyone that my family had had interactions with over the last really century that was any kind of impact on healthcare, uh, whether it was adjusting styles or herbals or nutrition or something they brought into it. And they gave me this list and my uncle told me, you know, when you graduate, he goes, find anyone and everyone on this list that's still alive and go train with them. And so I did. Uh, I literally went out and I found about a half a dozen of them that were still around and then they mentored me by introducing me to other people and it just really snowballed from there and that was it. That's what got me and you know once it gets a hold of you a little bit, there's a little bit of a, almost a fever I guess to it. Once it grabs you, it's hard not to want to see if there's more. You know, you hear all the rumors and the things of all the miracles that happened in the past and, and I look at that and I think, okay, well I don't hear those today. I'm not hearing about the doctors performing the miracles today like we did from the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, and I think, why not? And so I started digging around, and the more and more I dug, the more and more I thought, there's got to be something here. We're just missing it. Maybe we're not teaching any longer. Maybe it's died out. Maybe that piece is gone. You know, it, 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 that's what I started doing. So I started looking, and the more I looked and the more in-depth I got with it, the more I started realizing, oh, my gosh, the miracles still are here. We just have to have people to teach them. We don't have that many of them. And so that was kind of my quest and what got me going. Great story, man. You know, I, I, I just wanted to touch on one thing there. You said there's miracles, and that's been a word that Luke and I have uh, put into our next film, Project Patient. And as we put that word in there, I had a discussion with a colleague of mine today over in the Netherlands who has five practices over there, and we were talking, and he goes, you know what? We have to get away from the word miracles because that means that people don't believe it. He goes, what chiropractic does is it, 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 it's not a miracle anymore. <laughs> he, goes, he goes, that thing that happened with uh, Harvey Loder it wasn't a miracle. The things that happen with people getting their functionality back, it's not a miracle. He goes, miracles are from like a biblical sense. He goes, chiropractic, it's getting results for people. And he goes, that's, that's where we, we need to come with our, our languaging. And I, I, I was blown away by what he said to me. Now I'm blown away by what you have to say to me. So, you know, it's just, it's a meeting of minds. And when we start paying attention to the words that we use and the, the dialect that we allow ourselves to follow, um, we, we start to realize that there is a huge uh, um, responsibility for the chiropractor to go out there and to teach each other. Yeah, 
Yeah, I would agree with you completely, you know, and, and on my wall in my office when patients are going down my hallway, at the end of the hallway, there's a quote that Victor Frank, who was one of my mentors, uh, said all the time, and I have it on my wall there, and it says, if you don't expect a miracle, they tend not to happen. So you need to expect it, and I think the reason why he used that word miracle, what he was after with this, and the idea was that, look, there's nothing we cannot perform. To the average layperson, hey, you're not going to fix blood pressure with adjusting. You're not going to fix my ulcerative colitis, my Crohn's, my celiacs, whatever. Well, I've got 20 years to prove we can. And so you go at it from that mindset and say, look, that's why I think the word miracle comes in. Because you take something that's unbelievable, right? Most of our people today are locked into this model that if you don't drug it, it doesn't work. The problem is when you drug it, it doesn't fix it anyway. It just manages it. We're not after managing. We're after fixing. We're after curing. And it's a dirty word anymore. You're not supposed to use the word cure. Uh, you know, and it's like, why not? Why can't you fix things? Why can't you help the body eradicate problems and restore normal function and normal health? And that's really what we do, and that's what I do. Wow. And, you know, when we were first talking before we went live, we were talking about, you know, the business and the healer. And chiropractic has to have the healing hand, and it has to have the business hand, and that's some Sid Williams stuff right there. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when, when you think about the healer hand, um, there has to be a higher level of certainty, and there has to be uh, an, an objection to the belittlement that you guys aren't doing um, amazing work. And we have to play second fiddle, and we can't be first chair. And I think that the chiropractic profession is now finally starting to realize that the house of cards for what's popular um, is starting to fall. And now people are starting to look over their shoulders and they're realizing that those chiropractors are over there and they are healers. And that's something beautiful to me. Yeah, and I agree with you completely. You know, I think the idea that, you know, of being a healer is is to take it as far as you can. You know, and I, and I mentioned earlier about how my grandfather was heavily influenced by Dee Dee Palmer. He didn't like BJ. I uh, thought he was arrogant, thought he was cocky, uh, and just didn't like him. Now, I, I have, you know, hey, I'm neither or. I didn't know either one of them, gentlemen. Uh, but it's interesting that Dee Dee's approach to healthcare was so much broader than what BJ's was. You know, BJ really didn't like the concept of autosuggestion, didn't like the idea that there's an emotional component to healthcare. But his father was heavily, heavily invested in that. And he believed that had a major play in it. And so that's where the intent comes in, you know, when you're adjusting. And this is something that I, I, I learned this the hard way. Uh, as I would go around and I would work with different chiropractors and, and different adjusters and this and that, my grandpa used to always say, your style doesn't matter. Because it has very little to do with it. He goes, all the styles will work. The key is, is, what is your intent? What is your thought? What are you doing? How linked and in there are you with that patient? And I always use faith, confidence, and belief. You know, your patient has to have faith, confidence, and belief in your ability. But so do you. And if you don't have that faith, confidence, and belief in what you're doing, if someone walks in your office and they've got, you know, a staph infection or something of that nature, you have to have the faith, confidence, and belief that your skill set's going to allow that body to turn that corner and heal itself. If you don't have that, it will not happen. But the patient has to believe it as well. And then all you have to do is see it a few times. Once you start seeing these things happen, I think that's what Victor was talking about when he was describing those little miracles. He used to always tell me, don't lose sight of the things that are happening day to day in your office. He goes, they're going to be so commonplace that you're not even going to appreciate them anymore. He goes, appreciate the everyday fantastic things that occur. And as you do that, you start seeing, you start seeing the power that really made the body heals the body. And it does a phenomenal job if you know how to connect to it. So what are some things that make you unique in the chiropractic world? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> It's a different animal, right? Uh, I think the biggest thing is kind of my approach to it. You know, I believe that stress is the cause of all disease. I tease in my practice that men are the cause of all stress. And I'm really just following the mindset that there are three major things that affect that body. There are mechanical things, that's the M in men. It's accidents, it's traumas, it's slips, it's falls. It's things that have direct impact force on the anatomy and physiology. Then there's the E in the emotional stuff, and that's where you get into energy. It's where you get into the idea idea that there's a there's some kind of life force in us that's above and beyond just parts right we're not just like popping the hood on a car there's something there that's different you know it's interesting when they do the clinical studies on energy of the body when the body dies it loses 21 grams of weight instantaneously all living things do all mammals at least so when you look at that you start thinking all right what is that 21 grams what, what, what disappears when that happens it must be something and that's what they believe they believe it's a life force and there's a way to connect to that if you don't pay attention to that you don't realize that it's there and it's trying to drive the body in our profession we call it innate 
It's that innate intelligence. It's inside there, but every now and then we get in its way. You know, we do things, we eat poorly, we don't do the right things, we don't exercise, we don't stretch, we don't get adjusted. Uh, we have all these little things that block it up. You gotta learn how to free that. And the in and men for me is the nutritional chemical side of things. And I think that's the one thing that's changed the most since probably my grandfather was in practice. They didn't have all the assaults. They didn't have all the environmental assaults that we do today. You didn't have the, the, you know, the genetically modified foods and the herbicides and insecticides and all the changes that are there that are constantly hitting that body in a chemical way, forcing it to deal and adapt in a different manner. So I follow that model, and that's really the biggest thing I think that I do that's probably different than most uh, in my profession is about I balance that. And then it's a matter of really what do you use? What tools do you use? You know, Dee Dee Palmer was big on saying that you can throw a bucket of water on something somebody's head and if it heals them or cures them that's chiropractic care and that's very different than what was pushed after his son took over you know his son was more you got to adjust got to adjust got to adjust well the dad didn't follow that model and so I've leaned in my family and my grandfather, my uncles, we've all kind of gone the way of Dee Dee's model. And in doing so, that's where I tend to see things happen in practice that a lot of docs around my area don't. You know, I, I, one of the nicknames that Dr. Eric Naputi, a good friend of mine, always said, he goes, you're kind of the doctor's doctor. You know, I see everybody else's failures. And they'll come through, the, they'll come through my door. And in practice, you know, I like to track things. I'm very results driven. I don't care about the business side of stuff as much. I want to see clinical results. I want to see people get healthy. I want to see people heal. And so I track it. And I've added 80%. I have for a number of years now. So you walk in my door with anything, we have an 80% chance we're going to help your body heal that. Dude, that's amazing. You know, I just want to interject for a moment with you. And uh, you sound a lot like uh, our good friend Pete Goldman. He's, he created, uh, created the Zone Technique and the Zone School of Healing. And uh, he's, he didn't do anything new. He just took Thurman Fleet's work and uh, started to make that the norm. And that's what his school of healing does. And he's like, I don't care what you have going on. You come out here, I'll, I'll, get, I'll, I'll adjust you, and your body's going to take care of itself. And, you know, I think that another thing he said there was, I go back to what Didi do, does. And that's amazing because, you know, not a lot of these conversations that we have go back that deep. And Didi was the founder and BJ was the developer, and uh, BJ was somebody that did say early to early to bed, early to rise, work like hell, and advertise. Uh, Dee Dee was the guy that was like, "Hey, this is a secret." <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. You're absolutely. You know, it's funny you say that. Like the zone work, for example. Uh, my grandfather was very good friends with Thurman Fleet. And so Dr. Fleet's work and everything he did, I remember, and it didn't click with me. The first probably 10 years in practice or so that I was doing this, it didn't click that, hey, all right, I'm going through. I've done a bunch of therapy. I understood chiropractic. I thought I did. Uh, I was literally taking an acupuncture course because I've done Chinese medicine for years as well. And I was doing an acupuncture course, and the Chinese doctor was sitting there telling me, and the guy's world-renowned. He said, you know, there's a few things that are going to determine your success with acupuncture. And he goes, number one is needle placement. Where you put the needle, he goes, will work. But he goes, it's only about 20%, maybe 30 at best. And he said, that's all it is. He goes, you can be in the wrong place. And as long as your other two pieces are there, you'll get the results. And then Chinese medicine, they call it Dao Yin. It's movement and intent. It's moving the parts that are involved and then intent. It's the patient's intent, the doctor's intent, understanding what you're doing. And for something that happened when that happened to me, I heard that and I thought, boy, I've heard this before. I've heard this in our profession before. And I started calling my uncle up and he said, you know what? He goes, I think you're ready. And he sent me my grandfather's notes and I sent about three boxes to me. And all it was were books and notes and things, but most of it was work that he had done with Thurman Fleet. And it was all about the idea of zone therapy and understanding the zones. I mean, my family has used zone work for almost, well, since Fleet came up with it, uh, really invented it in the late 20s, didn't start teaching it openly till the 40s. My grandfather was good friends with him in the 30s. So I've had it in my family, you know, almost 90 years of doing zone work, and I've used it in practice for over 90 years. Uh, I've used it for 20 of my uncles. So it's just one of those things that zone therapy is fantastic, and I'm glad to see people are out there doing it, uh, but it never really went anywhere. It's been here all along. The difference is now you have social media, so it's easy to push it out. I don't know the other gentleman you're talking about, but I'm, I'm glad he's doing something with it, and that's awesome. It's nice he, to see it out there. Yeah, you know, the thing is, is he, he uh, didn't know how to really get this out to the masses either, his messaging behind his own school of healing. And uh, he is now a sponsor for Cairo Hustle. And uh, we've done what, everything that we can to give him more eyes and ears to his messaging. 
And I think that chiropractic is so damn simple when it comes down to it, you just have to be a great practitioner. And that's the real deciding factor whether or not somebody succeeds with their business hand um, and their adjusting hand. I think that there's so much that goes back to um, the actual, the adjuster, the chiropractic adjuster. And I think that there's a lot that goes back to the early parts of chiropractic. And like you said, there's people out there that have been passing generationally down a thousand years, um, you know, um, knowledge. And chiropractic has only been passing around a, a knowledge for 123 years. So we're still at the, the, you know, the infancy of what chiropractic really will become. And I, I do think, you know, based on our conversations is the more that we turn chiropractic into a standalone uh, profession rather than a medical styled profession, we are going to get a better outcome for the certainty in the chiropractor. Yeah, I would agree with you completely, you know, and I, I think that the, the problem I see because of my involvement with the universities uh, and being on the board at Logan for a number of years is, is seeing that there's a big shift in the education that's coming through the schools that's geared more towards uh, passing exams passing board exams, getting accepted across the whole, uh, worrying about that. And I understand, I get it, it's, it's never been a focus of mine. All right, you pass an exam, that doesn't teach you how to be a healer though. And you have to get around people that know how to heal to be a healer. It's very hard to come up on your own. And you know, one of the things I've always thought is why rediscover the wheel? Why not find people that have been in the trenches that have done the work? You know, I think back, uh, Howard Loomis and I are, are very close friends and he's mentored me over the years as well. And you know, Howard used to tell me stories Stories of, of doctors that would be in school with him and that they would be at practice and they would leave practice and then they would come over to school teach a couple classes and they go back in the trenches and that were the those were the instructors you don't have that now you know now you've got professional teachers that are there to teach you a theory or a concept but it's like yeah but they don't have that hands-on you know they don't have that real true clinical experience and you can see it in the profession uh, even since I've been out you can watch and see how it's just kind of boxed itself a little tighter a little tighter into a hole and you'll see a few guys that will try to hold their own but for the most part the whole profession's doing the same technique basically right it's a flying seven give or take a little here and there um, you know your zone guys will do a little differently maybe your activator guys will do a little differently but for the most part you really have I'd say 70% of the profession doing the exact same thing and the problem with that is whether it's diversified or some variation thereof old school chiropractic if you go back in time you start looking up different adjusting styles really get in there and look for them I found over 115 when I looked there were 115 unique different adjusting styles and I look at that today most guys couldn't list more than three or four you know, and you think, gosh, what happened to those? Where did they go? What was there, was there some benefit? What clinical pearls were tied to those things that maybe we lost? What was the, you know, the one doctor sitting out in maybe Topeka, Kansas someplace out in the middle of nowhere and goes, hey, you know what? I do really well with this one thing that I do, this one thing I rock star, but because he doesn't have an entire technique, it dies. Well, now with social media, that's changing, and that's one of the huge, wonderful things about like podcasts and social media and Facebook and YouTube. All these things are allowing us to connect on such a grand level, and I hope we see a resurgence in the profession because of it. So do you have any favorite motivational quotes or mantras or words of wisdom that you live by? <sighs> Yeah, John Moriano was a friend of mine. He was a chiropractor. He actually was on the board of a hospital in Louisiana. Uh, John used to always say, know what you know and know what you don't know. And I like that because it means, you know, when you're in the trenches with something, understand what you know, understand what you're aware of and what you're able to handle. And when you run into something you're not sure about, don't be afraid to punt. You know, sometimes I think we get too scared and too nervous about being willing to punt over to somebody else because, oh, my gosh, we may never see that patient again. Oh, my gosh, we won't. I bet I have two dozen chiropractors in the Springfield area that refer patients to me. And they're almost always for problems that they struggle with. When I'm done, I help them balance it. I kick them back over. I say, hey, you like you like Doc so and so? Go see them. You don't need me for this now. I've done what they needed to do because they just didn't know it, you know. And I, I, that's one of my favorite quotes, you know. And he later on he added to it. He said, know what you know, know what you don't know, and realize what you know, nobody else knows. And that really helped me a lot, you know. It was a big, big player for me because it made me very confident when I'm talking among peers, other doctors, things of that nature. They're not going to go someplace that I can't. 
because I don't get trapped into talking about things I don't know about. Mm -hmm. I keep them in my world, and my world is helping the body to remove the stresses that are affecting it and restoring normal function. That's what I do. Right? We term it as a subluxation, but that's what it is. That's what you do. Mm -hmm. You know, as I listen to you more and more, um, one of the quotes I like to tell people that I've come up with is, look in obvious places. And yeah. I think that that goes back to the exact point you just made is, yeah, I'm going to look and do what I know how to do best. And I've educated myself to a certain level of competency that the state regulates that I'm good, the collegiate zone uh, respects that I'm good, and uh, my colleagues uh, perceive that I'm good. So at that point, you just go forth and serve. Yep, and that's exactly it, you know, and it just goes back to the thing, own what you know to do, you know, and then never, you know, one of the big things I see a lot, and it's not our, it's not chiropractic, it's all professions, especially healthcare, we get complacent, you know, we get into what we do and we get complacent and we forget that we have to keep learning. You know, you got to keep constantly striving, constantly learning. You know, we were talking, I think, off air a little earlier here where I was just telling you what I'm going to do the rest of my day. You know, I, I know for sure I'm going to spend at least two hours brushing up on my education. I know from tomorrow morning from 5 a.m. till noon, I will spend that entire time in 25-minute increments. I'm a little anal. I set a timer for 25 minutes, and I will study one of the things I've learned in my career. When that goes off, I'll take a five-minute break, and I'll start it all over again, and I do it until noon. And that way I'm always keeping up with what I do. You know, when we talk about adjusting styles, I know probably two dozen. I mean, physically from beginning to end. I don't use them all. I have a few that I really, really like that I use a lot. But I make sure one day a week I bring in one of the styles I haven't done in a while. And I make sure I do that on most of the patients. I'll do it all morning one style. I'll do a different one all afternoon. But the results are the same because the adjustment's the same concept. It doesn't matter how I adjust it as long as I'm doing the adjustment with the right intent. So what's possible in the future with everything you're doing and accomplishing today? You know, I'll tell you, for, for me, one of the, the things I, I looked at our profession, because like, like I said, I was on the board at Logue, and I looked at our failure rate and what they actually market, what they tell you, or they may not tell you out loud. The failure rate in our profession is 80% of graduates will fail in the first three years. And that's across the board for all the chiropractic universities. And it, it alarms me. And I, I think to myself, how can it be that way? When you have such an amazing tool, how can it be that way? What's wrong with it? And so I started looking at the profession, and I really, really put a lot of effort in on this. And the more I looked, I noticed there's lots of marketing groups. There's lots of guys that will teach you how to uh, push your business, how to describe your business, and so on. But there's not a lot of guys teaching you how to make it all work how to make the chiropractic concept work, how to get the results, the clinical results that keep patients coming back, that keep patients healthy. You know, I have a kind of a rule I follow that, you know, you want patients that pay, stay, and refer. That's what you're after. And so you want those people that, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat you, I'm going to get you better, and you're going to want to tell your friends and family about me. Uh, and, and so when I looked at that mindset, I thought, okay, there's lots of great marketing material out there, guys that are just phenomenal at teaching you how to kind of get people excited and motivated, but it's still your results. And the thing that got me going on this, my wife and I, she follows a little blog on chiropractic care and stuff. She says, hey, I want, I want to share this with you. And it was a doctor that had mentioned, I said, hey, I went to a cash practice. And he goes, do any of you notice that in this little blog, he goes, has anyone noticed that when you went cash, your patients expect more from you all of a sudden? They want better results. They expect more. See, when it wasn't cash, nobody cared. Nobody's, they're not footing the bill. What's it matter if they show up or they follow through with treatment plans or your adjustment even does what it's supposed to do? That's just part of the thing. But when you go cash, now all of a sudden they have a dog in the fight and it hurts a little bit. So now they want you to get results. And it was alarming to me when I looked at the responses. There were probably 30, 35 different doctors that chimed in on this. And they all across the board were like, well, you got to lower the bar a little bit, lower their expectations, don't set them so high. And I got on there and I'm like, guys, are you kidding me? What's wrong with fixing them? What's wrong with getting better results? What's wrong with getting better clinical results that you can count on, that you can be assured of? So with that mindset in place, my wife and I decided, all right, we got to do something. So I'm starting a clinical mentoring program for doctors. Uh, I'm going to do basically a couple, probably weekly, a uh, half hour, 45 minute call in type thing like we're doing here almost. And it's just simply going to be to help them use the skills that they currently have and try to get them back to our roots, back to what I believe DD intended for the profession. So I'm setting up a clinical clinical mentoring program to assist physicians to get better results. 
Wow, that's awesome. You know, I think uh, a lot of what we do um, off the, you know, the front of running a podcast and making chiropractic films is we do marketing. Um, that's really what I did for, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like a long time, but I did a uh, straight 36 months of all I did is uh, chiropractic screenings. And I went out there and sold chiropractic. So when you're saying that the, the clinician needs to have better certainty for what they do on the back end, um, I think we need to start selling chiropractic better. Yeah, yeah. I would agree with you. I mean, you're, you're dead on, you know, and the thing is, I think what sells is, and again, I go back to Howard Loomis and he mentored me and he, when I first got into practice, I didn't have the marketing skills. I didn't have all that kind of stuff. I wasn't sure where to go and what to do and Howard flat out told me, he said, here's all you got to do. He goes, fix what walks in your door. He goes, if you fix it, it will take care of itself. And he said, now there's other ways to do this. And he goes, you can get better results and quicker. You can get more people in faster. And I think you have to have marketing. I think it's absolutely critical for our success in today's world. But you got to fix problems. And I think there's too many young doctors out there that are just like, well, we don't really do that. You know, oh, you got a blood pressure, Mrs. Smith, problem, this and that. No one thinks about how do you adjust it to get it to come down. My grandfather would have laughed at that. He'd be like, anybody get a lower blood pressure with an adjustment. But there's not a lot of guys that can do that anymore. They can't clinically actually see that happen. And so I thought, all right, why don't I help them on that end? Let marketing guys teach them how to get out there, how to get people seeing them. And then when they get in your door, I'll teach you how to get those clinical results. And by that combination of, of things together, the marketing and the positive clinical success, it's a win-win. And I truly believe this will help revive and rebirth the profession. You've made it to Cairo Hustle. Sit back and learn from the greatest influencers in the profession. This week's episode is brought to you by Pose for Cairo, Imaging Services, Zingit Solutions, Universal Tractioning Systems, Peter Goldman's Zone School of Healing, Legacy Wealth Management, Posture Screen, Cairo Thin, Everest Coaching Systems, Cairo Moguls, Rhino Coaching, Cairo Matchmakers, Chiropractic Jobs Online, and Bax Max. Let's hustle. Well, we're creating something, this might sound funny to you in the digital era, we're creating a concept called the human funnel system, where you have to have the front end, the lead magnet, the lead generator, you have to have proper procedures for once you get the leads, you have to follow up with them properly, you also have to have a staff or a doc that knows how to intake properly, you have to be able to convert once they show up, like you're saying, but you also have to be able to deliver the goods. So I'm, I'm so like dialed into old school. I know you study history of chiropractic and you study lineages and you study the greats. Um, but I, I think that the reason that, you know, you even sped up my brain. You like told me, that, <laughs> no, you did. You told me that 80% fail after three years. And I thought the stats were something like 50% uh, fail after five years. And, yeah. you know, that's alarming to me, either one of those. That's like saying that uh, we have the ability to create a, a chiropractor, but um, they're never going to go back and tithe to that school. They're never going to become the, the doctor that their family hoped them to become. And actually, it further hurts the brand equity of chiropractic when we have somebody that goes through the program that doesn't succeed. And we need to really pay attention to that at-risk group, which is that percentage of people that um, start out. So we need to give them like a jet pack to jump out of the, the school with when they get their opportunity to go practice. And we need to protect them like they're our most important asset. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. You know, and our profession is renowned for eating at junk. You know, we've been doing it forever and ever and ever. Everyone's intimidated. Everyone's nervous about, oh, I can't share what I know, how to fix an ankle problem or a hip or a, you know, a disc issue. I don't want to share my one thing because if I do that, the guy down the street may do it better or he may market it better and that'll hurt me and you see a lot of guys will hold their own will keep things really close to the vest and they don't play their hand out and, and the problem with that is is again we don't have the places to hide you know medicine can hide they can hide in research they can hide in development they can go work for some drug company or for some you know uh, orthopedic uh, device sales or this or that they can hide all over the place if they have zero personality our profession is not that fortunate 
You know, we can't hide. And so you have to have that ability to relate. And that's where, like, the marketing is really important. You know, I was very fortunate when I came out of school. I was going to what I call a residency uh, at Logan there. I chose Montgomery Clinic, which is the school-based clinic. Logan had four or five at the time around the St. Louis area. I chose Montgomery because I figured, all right, you've been here a better part of 100 years. Everybody and their brother around here has already been here. You're not going to get people that are just going to walk in and want to go see a chiropractor like you would at some of the other clinics. I wanted to draw them to that location. I thought if I can draw them here as a student, that I can draw them to my office as a professional when I get out. And that was my focus. So I had the fortunate opportunity, a gentleman that runs a, a syndicated national uh, radio show, I think it was called Health or Money Talk. And he was a patient of one of my friends at the school. And she had a baby visit or something that night. He's like, hey, can you see my patients for this afternoon? I'm like, sure, no problem. He was one of the gentlemen that was there. And he came in. And I only saw him the one time. And he asked me, hey, what are you doing tonight, doctor? He's real personable in this night. I'm like, well, you know, I'm going to do a talk here at the school. I'm um, talking about, you know, some things. And he goes, oh, great. He goes, have you ever considered doing radio? And I'm like, no. <laughs> I've never thought of a day in my life. And he said, well, you know, just the way you're talking and this and that. He goes, you're real comfortable to talk. He goes, put this in your head. Why would you ever want to talk to 30 people in a room when you can talk to 30,000 at once on air? And I thought, I don't know. And he said, literally, he told me, he goes, when you graduate, he goes, go get a radio show. And so I did. And 20 years later, I do a radio show. Now I do it three times a week up here in my market on three different stations. Uh, and so I've done radio live on that for 20 years. And, you know, it's been a, a huge, huge builder for my practice. And I know it's kind of old school, but it built credibility. And to let people understand that, hey, this guy's still here. You know, he was talking about this a year ago. He was talking about it five years ago. He's still here. It's still going. And then you add in today's social media now with Facebook and all these things you can do and podcasts like what you guys are doing. The opportunity to get out there and let people see you is huge. And, you know, that was a big defining moment in my career. So taking everything you said into consideration, where do you see the profession finding itself in the next 20 years? If we don't kind of rally a little bit and go back to some of our roots and really rediscover what we're all about, I think that we're going to have problems because I see it. I've, I've watched the writing on the wall really since I graduated and was on the board. Uh, I know what the failure rate when I graduated was 70%. I know it's now 80 so it's gone up. Uh, the cost of the education has probably doubled. Uh, I think most kids, when they come through school now, they're getting close to 200 grand or more in the hole. Uh, that's a lot in a profession like in the state of Illinois. The average chiropractor, I think, makes 47, 48 thousand a year. Uh, if you're in Chicago, the average is around 78. Now, there's a lot of guys that make 100, 200, 300. And you don't do more than that. I mean, I run a seven-figure cash practice, uh, and I've been cash since day one. And so you can do really, really well. But if I'm doing that on my end, then there's a whole lot on the other end that are bringing those numbers down. And so I look at that and I think to myself, what do we got to do? We got to look at what you guys are describing there, the marketing aspect, streamlining your practice, understanding that, look, when someone walks in the door, there's a lot of holes that people can fall through. And what you were describing earlier, helping them understand that if you put these procedures in place, you can streamline the practice. On the back end, we have to get results. The idea of, you know, and this is my opinion, and I don't want to step on toes, the idea that we're, we, we're, we're kind of standing on the shoulders of my grandfather's generation. You know, we're saying, look, these guys did all these great things, but we, we, we claim to do it, but I don't see it. You know, I don't see it as much. I don't see, you know, Mrs. Smith comes in to see me and look, she's got a herpatic lesion on her leg. She's got uh, neck pain. Maybe she's got ulcerative colitis. She might have 20 years of heartburn and she's on three blood pressure meds. I don't see the care that we do across the board alleviating all that. And until it does, I think we're going to have problems because in my grandfather's day, they did. That's what they did. They believed in what they did. They understood it. They got the intent. And the gentleman you were talking about earlier that started the zone work, the entire zone technique was designed to fit inside that model. Uh, but Thurman Fleet, again, was heavily influenced by D.D. Palmer. I think if we go back to those roots and we get back there, we're going to see the profession really turn the corner. Because as you see, functional medicine is kind of the darling term right now. <laughs> it's, what chiro it's what chiropractic's always been. <laughs> right, we we were we are the originators of functional medicine. We're it, right? We call it chiropractic, but that's what we are. We got all these people jumping on board right now, trying to basically do what we've always done. 
Mm -hmm. We just got to make sure our whole profession realizes, hey, we've always done this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that what you're saying is so true. And, you know, we can congratulate ourselves a lot during this interview, but I think that we're on the same wavelength. And I think, you know, when I start realizing that the people that, you know, go back to like the real adjusting and they do a streamlined style business, they are successful and they do have good quality of lives and people do look up to them. And I think that that's really where the, we need to start, you know, patching up the holes in the chiropractic business model and making people more successful. And I think, you know, a clinical certainty is one of those things that will never go out of uh, popularity. And, uh, and if we look down 20 years from the line, if we don't have people that are more certain in their adjusting skills rather than their referral skills, um, we have a, a big problem ahead of us. So I love the pioneers that still keep the adjusting seminars going, like the Gonstead Clinic. I love what they're doing with the Zone uh, School of Healing. And, you know, I, and you're right. You know, now we're starting to parcel off little parts of the chiropractic truth to other people that steal the thunder, like functional medicine. Like, get out yeah. of here. Like, that's, like you said, it's been chiropractic since day one, bro. <laughs> That's how it works, and then, and then and, you know the thing is, like I look at like physical therapists. You know, there's an interesting profession, um, and and what they do, and there's some advantages. They have some nice things that they offer, and they have some nice pieces they put into place. But one of the things I think that's going to hurt our profession if we don't step up and kind of reclaim who we once were, if we don't make that. Uh, assertion and reclaim that territory, you're going to see a profession like physical therapy do exactly what it's done to acupuncture as of late. They're doing dry needling now. They don't call it acupuncture because that would be against the law and they would require four more years of education. So they get a two weekend seminar and they all look, we dry needle and they just shortcut it. Now the problem with that is the society looks at that and says, oh look, this is acupuncture, but it's not. And it doesn't get the results that acupuncture gets. It doesn't work nearly as well as acupuncture does and it never will. It's a shortcut watered down version. Well, there are no different with adjusting, right? There's many, many states where the physical therapists are adjusting and things of that nature. And here's where the problem comes in. The main establishment in healthcare accepts them. They're not a thorn in their side. They accept them readily. See, in the past, when we were always being challenged, you know, when you get into, gosh, I'm trying to think of the trial in Chicago, the Wilkes trial, and you get into the slander and all the things that occurred against our profession, there was nobody else competing with us. Physical therapy learned that, hey, you know what? We don't have to slam them. We'll just take it. And they can do it for about a quarter of the price. And so that's a huge issue for us. I don't know that we thought about that, that if we stick on this idea of adjust, 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 then you have a few guys say, look, I do it my way. I get great results. My great adjusting will always be to PT. And they're right. They will. But in the 80% of our profession that's failing, great adjusting isn't there. We have mediocre work that's being done, and the PTs can do mediocre work. So now you've got a cheaper alternative to what we're doing. And I do believe if we don't step up and reclaim what was ours and what, reclaim what really we created, then we're going to have some problems down the road. Hopefully little things like what you guys are doing here with podcasts and that the gentleman doing his school that you mentioned and you know me trying to help out with the mentoring program, hopefully we'll get enough momentum behind this that it will totally rebirth the profession. So I know we talked a lot about radio and podcasting and social media. Do you have any other favorite marketing tactics to spread your message out? You know, I mean, social media is probably the biggest, uh, I would say. You know, Facebook, things like that, it has probably been the thing that has, has the greatest impact and the greatest reach for the least dollars that I can see, you know, because I've spent a lot of money on lots of different things over the years uh, and, and tried different concepts and this and that because I always had the results. So I looked for, okay, how do you get people interested in what you do? Because, you know, I have a muscle technique I do. It's called muscle memory reintegration. I invented this about four or five years ago. I'm the only one around that does it. The minute I mentioned it on radio, there's four offices in town saying, oh, yeah, we do muscle memory work. And this and that. I'm like, well, you can't because I invented this. <laughs> I'm the only one, and I've never shown it to anyone yet. Uh, I haven't taught it as of yet. And so I'm looking at that going, wait a minute. But it's, you see that a lot, you know. So the, 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 the social media aspect has changed the game. Game, I think it, it has taken uh, I do a lot of videos um, I don't do as much type as I once did I used to write articles all the time and I started doing videos and the more I did videos the more people could really truly see what I'm about and what I'm doing and so I do a mailbag segment uh, I do it on radio I also do it on my on my Facebook page I love that people say look ask me anything you want 
I'll shoot a video on how I would treat it and how I would go about balancing it for you and give you some direction. And I think that's helped me a ton. Uh, you know, our numbers are improving a bunch on our overall, what we get our viewership with. I had a marketing company uh, that was local look into our numbers and just kind of track our videos. And our open rate was, our click open rate was about 85, 86%. But what was impressive about it was how many people watched the entire video. We're up over 60% on all of our videos and they said that's an anomaly it's a unicorn uh in in the in the healthcare world they go you just don't see it you know it's 10 seconds and we're done we're on to something else people hang in for three four five six minutes into what we're saying but what we're saying is what our profession has been saying all along it's just said a little differently and you know like i said before and i don't want to beat a dead horse too much i truly believe that when dd palmer left the profession the profession changed forever and i think that it didn't all necessarily change in a good way across the board we learned how to market we learned how to get our name out there but we didn't we got away from kind of our core roots and i'm really thinking that if we can try to get the profession back to what what, what it was intended to do across the board i think you've got something greater than anyone ever imagined I think you're onto a lot of great ideas, man. And uh, it, it's cool that you understand, like, once again, the lineage of chiropractic. And I think that that's something that people are really going to pay attention to this episode and they're going to take away a lot of the stuff. Plus, you know, I think both of us have been very transparent with our belief systems on the system. And I think that that's highly important because I think a lot of the shows that you'll get on are people will host you on or, you know, have the cultural conversation they still don't talk about the elephant in the room. And I think that that's a huge thing when it comes to when we do marketing is we keep our, our uh, concerns to ourselves too. And we, we just focus on helping people. And I think a lot of times um, the chiropractor has such a, a bruised up self-esteem <laughs> that they don't even know how to go and do a proper marketing event because their, their ass is kicked, you know? And, you know, th when we think about, you know, media and, and getting traction, that's so important for people to look in the obvious places and do things that work. And if they can start creating videos that people pay attention to, now more people are getting indoctrinated into the chiropractic truth. And, you know, it's never been easier as a profession either to get the message out to more people. You know, a lot of times when we ask people a question, well, we didn't ask you, but I'll just pose, to, pose it to you is, we asked people what the most uh, important thing kind of to happen in chiropractic over the last decade has been. And a lot of people will tell me social media. But now that we have these little uh, media machines in our hands, we need to start leveraging them. And we have to start hitting the media and the market with messaging that's uh, effective while it's still at a low barrier of entry because YouTube, it's only going to get more expensive. Uh, Facebook, it's only getting get more expensive. So right now is kind of like the golden era for um, media distribution at a low barrier of entry. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I agree with you completely. You know, it's it's a way to engage, and it's a way to engage almost in a grassroot level. You know, you, you look at right now, essential oils are kind of a darling right now. You see it uh, all over the place. It's very grassroots, very uh, what I call kitchen healthcare, kitchen herbology. Um, you know, it's it's women, and they've done an excellent job of marketing at that and pushing that out through there. And you know, ours is no different. You know, and they do a lot on social media. You see their their ads and what they're doing, and it's a, it's a very smart smart tool that they're using because they're looking at this saying look my mom reads my Facebook page and so does my sister and so does my sister's daughter who's off in college and then she's got 10 friends and so it's got a nice reach to it and if you have something that's engaging and you're sincere that's a big key to this you have to be sincere in what you're doing you have to truly truly want to help people and I think the lion's share of docs that get into chiropractic that's what they do it for right they want to help somebody. They've had some experience themselves where some doc made a difference in their life. You know, and I'm talking about all the, you know, hey, different techniques and stuff. That's not that important, right? And, and in the mentoring that I'm going to be doing, that, that's my focus. Take what that doctor has. Take what their skill set is. And how can I help them with their skill set solve the riddles that are in front of them? You don't have to know 95 things, but you do have to know the one or two things you know well, really well. And that's the key to it. And if you can do that and you can then use social media to what it does best, which in this case is spread the message of care, right? Most of the, there's a lot of negative crap out there. And we always see that stuff, but that's not what you're after. You're after saying, look, I'm going to share something with you that I truly believe is going to have an impact on your life. You know, I made a New Year's resolution this year. 
um, from the radio shows that I do. And on the, I told everybody, you know, beginning of the year, here's my New Year's resolution. Every time I do a show, and I'm on three times a week on three different shows. So I figure, all right, I got 52 weeks in a year, multiply it by three. I have at least 150 opportunities to say something that's going to allow someone to change their life for the better. And that's my focus. And I tell everybody on my shows, this, year, this is what we're doing. I'm going to say something. I don't know what it'll be, but I want to say something. Every show, I want to have one thing that's going to change one person's life. And at the end of the year, if I can impact 150 people, that's fantastic. If those people share that through social media and through Facebook and things of that nature, and that gets me 1,000 people, 5,000 people, that's even better. The key is we're just trying to help people lead their lives and have as high a quality filled life as they possibly can. And I think the deck is stacked against us. You know, whether it's whether it's monetizing things or commercialism or medicine or whatever it may be that's out there, there's a lot against us. We gotta have someone in our corner. You gotta have someone that's kind of the, the dark horse that's there. And I always tease that I'm the Robin Hood of healthcare. You know, I'm this is what I'm doing. I'm trying to help people get their lives back against a very, very difficult situation. And if we can do it the right way, we can really make amazing results. So what are some fun things you like to do outside of practice? What are some of your mar- hobbies? I'm a martial art nut, man. I'm a martial art nut. Uh, you know, I've been doing it forever. Uh, I still train actively. I've been fortunate enough that I've been in the right place at the right time. I've trained with some of the best guys in the world. Uh, I've done military. I've worked with SEAL teams. I've worked with... Um, just about every kind of close quarter combat group you can imagine. So that's one of my big things that I really, really, truly enjoy. Uh, my son got me playing PUBG, which is the demon of my existence. Uh, it's a little crazy, weird shoot up game on an iPad that he played. That's how we bond together. He's really good at it. I'm really not. Um, but that's kind of fun. But, you know, I read. I do things. I played sports in college. Um, you know, I just, I, I'm active. I, I just, I, I really enjoy it. I spend a lot of time with my wife. Uh, and just, you know, I think that's a big part of it, too, that gets lost sometimes. People forget that you ha- if you have a family or something outside of work, don't let that slide because of work. Because I'm a little bit of a workaholic. You know, and I, I'm obsessive about things, as you guys can probably tell. Uh, I'm a little type A, a little obsessive. Um, so I, I try to do that. You know, I enjoy travel. I enjoy going places and seeing things. But when I'm there, a lot of times I like to look people up. I like to say, hey, who's in this area? What doc do we have around here? Is it a Cairo? Is it an acupuncturist? Is it an herbalist? What can they share with me or a, a pearl? I'm always hunting for those clinical pearls. So that's really what I do, you know. And what's nice about the, the martial arts for me uh, is that it really opened my eyes into different cultures and different healing. You know, I've done Korean, Japanese, Filipino. I've trained with the Gracies out of Brazil uh, for a number of years in their jiu-jitsu. And it's, just, it's interesting to see all these different cultures. And when you look at an art like that that transcends all these cultures, there's always a healing side to it. And then there's always a family side to it. And and, and you see how they prioritize things. And so as you learn that, it gives you life lessons. And I think the best thing I learned from all of this, when it came to martial arts, you learn from your failures. You know, when you get beat at something or someone catches you or they get you in an arm bar or something of that nature, you learn, oh, how did I get caught? Healthcare is no different. You learn from your failures. And I think a lot of docs are afraid to fail. It's okay as long as you learn from it. And then you quest after that to say, well, what I do now, what could I have done different? What could I made a change on? And so those things, you know, I'm just really enjoying life. I enjoy music. I enjoy radio. There's a, lot, there's a ton of stuff I like to do. Are you in the middle of any good books right now? Yeah, I'm reading, uh, I, I, I really like Bruce Lipton's book, The Biology of Belief. I've read it several times. I enjoyed that a lot. Um, there's one called Learn Like Einstein that I'm currently reading uh, that I enjoy that. I'm reading one of uh, Thurman Fleet's books on uh, chiropractic philosophy and principles that I'm reading. I'm always reading at least three or four at any given time. And I try to spend about an hour a day every day getting at least that little bit in. The greatest thing ever invented were audiobooks. Uh, I can hop in that car, my drive to work, my drive home, I can get through books that way, uh, which is, there's all, there's so much out there, you know. Um, one of my favorite books I just read recently uh, was about the Irish culture, and the Scots-Irish, um, and it was called Born Fighting, and I think Jim Webb, the uh, senator from Virginia, wrote it, and it's a phenomenal book on, on the history of Ireland and how they really created the American culture, what we know as the John Wayne kind of culture, came out of the Irish, and so since <laughs> I got the last name McCaffrey, you know, you gotta gotta like the Irish. <laughs> So this is the part of the show where we ask you for websites, social media links. Where can people get in touch with you? 
Sure, yeah. No, um, we have McCaffreyHealth.com is one of our biggest ones that we have. That's my website. Uh, obviously, uh, McCaffrey Health on Facebook. Uh, we have a new one we're getting ready to put up here, which will be our McCaffrey Mentoring Program. Um, that will be one of my new ones that we're going to do. Uh, there you go. My wife tells me DrSeanMcCaffrey.com. <laughs> uh, but it'll be coming up here pretty soon. You know, I mean, that's really how we do most of this stuff. Uh, I podcast my radio shows every week. Those are always put up on there. But it's just easy ways for people to get a hold of you. And it, the key to all this, again, and I appreciate you guys doing this. I really like doing the interviews. They're fun. Um, it's just I think that we have a great, great profession. And I think there's many ways to do it correctly. You know, there's no there's no perfect one way this is how it all has to be done. I think there's many, many ways to do it. The key to it is just understanding its roots, what it was able to achieve at one time, and realize, gosh, if it could do it then, why can't it do it now? And it can. You just need the right guidance and instruction to get that going. And what you guys are talking about, about the marketing aspect, you've got to have that too. So if you can blend those two things together, you can have a really a phenomenal practice. You can help out tens of thousands of patients change their lives. And if that's really what you're after, then you're in the right profession. Well, this pretty much wraps up this episode, unless there's anything else you wanted to say that we didn't ask you. No, you know, I, I think you guys did a great job. I mean, I got a zillion other things I do, but no, this is good. It, it, it's great. I enjoyed doing it. I, I appreciate it a lot. You know, it's, it's just something I hope that, again, if I say one thing here, maybe it's something about, you know, DD. Maybe it's something about chiropractic. It's just one little piece that just gets that light bulb to go ding and someone's noodle. Then we'll, then we'll do it. My wife's telling me, tell them about a laboratory. <laughs> I run a lab, too. I've done a lab for about 20 years. Uh, it's an epigenetic profile lab. Uh, it's a urine test that I run. And so, But that's something I do as well. But anyway, that all being said and done, man, that's what I do. Well, you know, I just want to thank you from our perspective over here um, for your ability to share with us and to have the depth and knowledge to speak so um, robust of the chiropractic uh, profession and I think that people do need to hear what you have to say and you know what my noodle did get uh, a message from you today too and uh, it just means that we all need to work harder together and uh, one of my mentors Ed Osborne who started the chiropractic philanthropist said we're all more alike than we are different and yeah. the more that I can help you the more that we help each other the better for chiropractic that's my humble opinion. Yeah, and you're 100% right. You know, we're all in this together, and that's the reality of it. You know, we are one profession that has one goal in mind, and that was the idea behind it when it was created. It was to, you know, really help people regain their lives and lead the best quality for life they can. And there's there's so many levels to it. There's so many levels to it. And depending on the level you want to play in, that's fine. Just as long as you're out there with that right heart and the right mindset, I think we can do amazing things. we just got to help people get back on the right track. All right, Sean, thank you very much for being our guest today, and I just want you to enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate it. You too as well. Thank you so much, Sean. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Thanks for listening to Cairo Hustle. Don't forget to subscribe and check back next week to continue hustling.